Good morning. And uh, Baba Mfuzi, Mama Mfuzi, thank you very much for your words. They brought back good memories, and uh, I felt like I should start speaking in Zulu, and, but I think I'll pass on that. So today is New Year's Eve, and I imagine that many of you have different traditions that you do uh, to celebrate. When uh, one of the traditions that I had as a young boy, I would uh, stay awake as long as I could and hopefully be able to see the, the ball from Times Square, you know, reach the bottom and to celebrate, oh, it's New Year's on the East Coast. And then we would sometimes be able to fire off firecrackers at our house in Illinois um, during that time. They were small ones, though. As I got older, then it was to try to stay up as late as we could. We were involved with the youth group, and so it was all night long that we would stay up. I don't know if any of you are still in that category, but that was something in our past. Uh, then, um, when I went to South Africa, we uh, would celebrate New Year's Eve at Sunbury, the camp that, we, uh, that Zima owns. And one of the nice things about living in South Africa is that you can buy gigantic fireworks. <laughs> I, you're, I'm not talking about bottle rockets. I'm talking about fireworks that were this tall. And so that was something that uh, we looked forward to with my boys. We would go to the nearest town and go to the shop in Stanger and buy fireworks. And then we would bring them back to Sunbury, set up the cinder blocks so that we would, the, the fireworks would head in the correct direction. And then at 12 o'clock, uh, we would blow off all these fireworks and have a huge celebration. And as my boys got older, it was really a pleasure for me to sit back and watch them enjoy and light the, light the fireworks. So I just want to say that, have to confess, last year we were back at Sunbury for New Year's Eve. It was right before the Zima conference. And so uh, I went ahead and I, I bought some fireworks, and some of the families had arrived early. And so uh, we decided to light off some fireworks. But I started about 10 o'clock. And I got done about 10.45, and Carlene and I were in bed by 11 o'clock. <laughs> so, so I don't know what your tradition is or, uh, or, or how you guys do it. Uh, I won't admit what time of the night I'm going to be going to bed tonight, though. <clears throat> Another thing that I've noticed about New Year's Eve is that uh, people like to make New Year's uh, resolutions. And so I looked up the most common New Year's resolutions. And here are some of them. First one was exercise more, lose weight, get organized. A fourth one, learn a new skill or a hobby. Five, live life to the fullest. Six, save more money. Seven, spend less money. Eight, quit smoking. And nine, spend more time with family and friends. Now, I also learned when I looked this up that 44% of Americans make a New Year's resolution. But what's, it's not surprising. By February, 81% of those people have either stopped or failed. And they're trying to change habits or trying to develop new habits. And it's difficult. I know in, in my life, I'm sure in your life, it's difficult to change patterns or habits that have become routine for us. It's difficult to start new patterns or habits. But I'm thankful that we have a God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who started a work in our lives and in your life, and that he has promised to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what does that look like? when God is developing new patterns, new habits in our lives. If you'll turn to John chapter 15, verse 1 through 17, I'm just going to go through some of those. So what does it look like? 
God wants us to abide in Jesus. God wants us to abide in his word. God wants us to abide in his love. So what does this word abide mean? I know that Drew, when he read it, it said to remain. Um, I've also looked it up and it says to remain stable, to stay constant, to trust. So Jesus is asking his followers to stay constant, to remain stable in their relationship with him. Jesus is asking his followers to stay constant, to remain stable in his word, in their obedience to his word. And Jesus is asking his followers to stay constant, to remain stable, to trust that Jesus loves them, and to stay constant in their love for him and for others. Now before we dive into the passage, I want to go over some facts about the book of John and also about Jesus' words. Now, Drew mentioned some of the different I am statements that you guys have heard over the last few months. I am the bread, I am the door, I am the light. Today we're going to do I am the vine. But why did Jesus, why, sorry, why did John put these stories and these signs and these statements all together in his gospel? Why did he put these in? If you'll turn to John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, you'll get the reason why John did this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. So he gave us these statements. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John put these statements together. He put these signs together. He put all of these words of Jesus together so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the anointed one. He is Israel's Messiah. He is the king who is coming and had come. The son of God, he wanted us to believe that he is the son of God and that by, by believing you might have life in his name. So John included the story of Jesus saying, I am the vine, so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now we also know that John, sorry, that Jesus came preaching the gospel and declaring that the, that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus was ushering in this kingdom, this new kingdom. So when we look at the Old Testament prophets, and when they talk about this kingdom coming, how do they describe it? In Micah and in Zechariah, we see that the followers of Yahweh would be in his new kingdom, and that they would sit under the vine and under the fig tree, and there would be no more fear, and that God would provide for them. So the Jewish people, they knew that this vine had significance for this new kingdom that was coming. The last point about the vine in the Old Testament was that Israel was described as a vine in Isaiah chapter 5. It says, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. But Isaiah goes on to describe Israel, and he says that there was no justice, there was no righteousness in Israel, and that they yielded wild grapes. And it also says in Isaiah, they won't be pruned. And so we see that Israel was a false vine. And so Jesus, he comes on the scene, and he says in John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. And so Jesus comes along and declares himself the true vine. He is the one who will usher in this new kingdom, his kingdom. He is the one who will give you rest, he will give you shade, he will give you nourishment, and he'll give you life. The Jewish people, 
they had put their trust in that they were Israel, that they were the descendants of Abraham, that they were, that they had the temple, that they had the Torah. But they had put their trust in a false vine. And Jesus comes along and he wants them to put their trust in him. He wants them to remain stable, to stay constant in their belief in him. Now, are there false finds in our lives? Are there things in our lives <clears throat> that we put our trust in and not into to the true vine? And I thought of a couple of things that I've see, seen that I think that some people put their trust in education, that if they achieve this level, if they get that master's or if they get that doctorate, then they're going to have security. And maybe another thing that I've heard a lot um, is that if I, if, if I get that retirement account up to this level, then I'm going to have security. Or maybe it's popularity. That if I fit into that crowd at school, then I'll get accepted. Or maybe possessions. Maybe it's something of that if, if I just get that new toy, that then I'll have arrived. But we see that Jesus said that I am the true vine, and I'm the one that gives life to the branch, to us. Jesus is the one that gives us joy. Jesus is the one that gives us security. He's the one that gives us contentment. He's the one that gives us acceptance. So as we go on in the passage, we see that the father's job is the vine dresser and, or the farmer, okay? Now, what was the job of the farmer in the vineyard? Now, the, the people that Jesus was talking to, they understood very well what he was talking about when he said about, I'm the vine, the father is the vine dresser. It was a person that prepared the ground, got rid of the weeds, made sure the uh, ground was moist. Uh, he would also get rid of the branches that were not producing. He would also prune the branches uh, that are bearing fruit so that they would produce more fruit. Another thing that I, I, I just learned about in the last month, that with a person that takes care of a vineyard, is when they prune that branch, they cut it off at an angle to direct the branch back to the vine. And so they, they choose the direction that that vine is going to grow in. And so Jesus knew his listeners would get his illustration. They knew that. Um, do you guys understand what he was talking about when he talks about a vineyard and a branch and a vine? I'm not a farmer. I never had a vineyard. Has anybody out there, have you guys ever had a vineyard? Do you guys, farmers, vineyards, anybody? Okay, there's one person back there, okay? And so, um, I was given the opportunity, Carlene and I were given the opportunity to uh, go on a retreat. We have a foundation in South Africa, the Mergon Foundation, that is partnering with Zima. And one of their main purposes is to make sure that the leadership is strong and healthy. And so they sent Carlene and I on a retreat, and we got to go to Franz Hook in the Cape Town area in South Africa. And it was gorgeous. If you've never been to Cape Town, you'll see, and I know Baba Mfuzi uh, would testify that Cape Town is a beautiful part of South Africa. And they have vineyards all over that area. And so Carlene uh, took some pictures of the vineyards, but let me tell you one more thing. <clears throat> As part of that retreat that we took, our, our leader gave us John chapter 15, 1 through 17 on a piece of paper, and he told us that we should uh, go out into the vineyard as a couple, and that we should read that passage and then look at the vines and, under, and try to begin to understand it and see what God was talking about, and see if the Spirit of God would speak to us. And so let me just uh, show you some of those pictures. So this is a, um, a, a young uh, branch, and you can see the vine that goes along, 
And you can see it, it's been cut back really severely. I mean, pruning is severe. It takes it all the way down, and then you can see some new growth that's growing onto it. Looks really healthy. Now look at this next picture. Um, do you notice anything about the branches there? What, what stood out to me was, do you see the vine, and do you see the branches? They almost look alike. So these branches have been pruned year after year after year after year, and that they begin to take on the appearance of the vine. They're still cut back way far so that they will, will produce fruit, but what was amazing to me is I thought, man, you know, I wonder if that's what Jesus was talking about, that his pruning, that we become more and more and more like the vine. We begin to look like the vine. Let me show you this next picture. Now this, um, th this would be a good example of maybe Israel. This is a, a vineyard that was not pruned. It's a wild vine. Uh, it does have some fruit, but you can see the branches are going all over the place. There's weeds. It's not living up to its full potential. And this is a, this is a pruned uh, vine vineyard. And man, I tell you, those grapes look good, eh? You know, they're luscious and they're plump. And you know, it's almost like the leaves are perfect. It's been sculptured, you know, in that way. So we see Jesus is the true vine. He gives strength, he gives power, and he gives life to the branches, to us, as we abide in him. The Father provides direction, keeps the branches directed back to the vine, keeps us directed back to Jesus. The Father continues year after year after year to prune us, to push us back to the vine, to push us back to Jesus. Now, can you think of people in your life that you would consider to be fruitful people? Uh, or people maybe that you've read a book about that have uh, exemplified the life of Jesus? You know, what did they go through in their life? These people probably experienced the most extraordinary suffering or problems or difficulties or weaknesses. Let me read you a story about one of those persons that went through a lot of difficulties. If you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to start at verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of me on my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am, and, and I am not weak? Who is made to, to fall? And am I not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Eratos was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. 
but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. We're going to continue in chapter 12. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will, not, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So that's the, that was the life of Paul. And I imagine the father was doing a lot of pruning in his life. And yet he continued to abide, to remain stable, to remain constant, to trust in Jesus. I believe that God uses these things in our lives to be a catalyst to direct us back to Jesus. How does God prune? He can use hardships, loss of loved ones, failures, persecution, disappointments. Now, I'm not saying that God is the one that causes all of these problems, but he uses these problems in our life. This pruning is intended for your production of fruit. James 1, 2 says, count it all joy when you face trials. First Peter says, in this rejoice, though now for a little while, you have been grieved by various trials. I th- was thinking of examples that I've uh, experienced, and I've seen it in people that I've worked with. There's a gentleman by the name of Londagani Bonambi. He's a man that I've worked with for many years. Um, he's a really tall guy, if any of you guys have seen him. Um, but he, he, he walks kind of funny because he's got issues going on with his feet and his legs. And he told me his story one day, and he said that since he was born, he's had issues with his feet. And as a child, he would hurry home after school because the kids would make fun of him and bully him. And that went on year after year after year. Now, Bonami came to our, uh, was brought to us by his church, and Zima sponsored him to go to a full-time Bible school, and he got saved at the full-time Bible school. Praise God. And Bonambi um, was just on fire. And he would come around to meetings with us, and he began teaching at Zeb's. And now Bonambi is asked by church after church after church, please, would you come and teach the truth at our church? Because of his mag- his, the way that he br- presents the truth, people just love him and love to listen to him. But like I said, he's a tall guy, and he still walks funny. He still has the issues with his feet. And yet, in his weakness, God is is demonstrating his power. Another example that I thought of that I was challenged with in my own life, Um, and it was a pruning that God did and is doing in my life, even today, through those words. <clears throat> uh, at, the, at the Zeb schools that we have in South Africa, uh, one of the most asked questions that I got, I don't know how Baba 
Fuzi what would be the most asked question, but in our schools, it was, what does the Bible say about ancestor worship? And they wanted to know. And it didn't matter what topic we were talking about, they had a question that somehow related to the ancestor worship. And so at Sunbury, <clears throat> after about the second year, there was about 30 students, and they really wanted to get this and really wanted to nail this thing down. And so they asked the teachers if we would stay after class and talk about what the Bible says about ancestor worship. And so after uh, going through the scriptures and looking at, at verses that they use and helping them to understand the context, one of the older bishops in the back of the class, he stood up and um, he, said, he said, I think I get it. What you, what you missionaries are saying, that you're saying that when we become followers of Jesus, there's things in our culture that we need to leave behind. And then he pointed at us and he said, Leo, when you became a follower of Jesus, what did you leave in your culture? And I'm telling you, that question has been pruning me for 28 years of just evaluating the way that I am as an American Christian, that maybe there's things in my life that are not pleasing to God and might be hindering me in my relationship with Jesus, and I am blind to it because I'm so in, I'm so in to my American culture. And it's the same way that I believe that God has given, why God called us to South Africa, Bob and Fuzi, is that to help them to see that there's things in their culture that, that are not pleasing to God and that they need to leave behind, but they've Christianized them. And you know something? When Africans come here, and I'm not, I'm not putting Bob and Fuzi and Mama Fuzi on the spot, but <laughs> if you ask them, if you, I don't, yeah, maybe you'll do it. <laughs> if you ask them, what do you think of Western Christians? And, and hear what they have to say. That's a question that I've been asking people as I get to know them at Trinity. There's some African students that I've gotten to know. And I ask them, what's your impression of Western Christianity? And it's amazing what you'll hear, you guys. And it just opens our eyes. We need each other. And, and sometimes God uses relationships to prune us, to get rid of things, and to bring us back to Jesus. Now, I just want to touch on the branches that were taken away. Um, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and they would later find out that Judas had betrayed Jesus. Okay? And so in John chapter 13... Verse 10 and 11, listen to what this says. Jesus said to him, as Jesus is speaking now, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. And then, what's interesting is then John the writer adds this sentence, adds this sentence afterwards. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said... Not all of you are clean. So, God, so John's given us an explanation of this. And so I think it's the same way with this abiding and, and branches being taken off, that there's people that say that they are Christians, but they're not abiding in the vine. Another thing that I learned from this, this passage as I was looking through it is, and you guys probably heard it, um, is that there is a... Um, a working together of, of us abiding in the vine, us abiding in Jesus, us abiding in the word, us abiding in his love. So we're supposed to choose to remain stable, to remain constant, to trust in Jesus. And the Father is doing the pruning. So there's a working together of Christians and God in the life of the Christian. The choices we make and the works that the Father is doing in our lives, that we are becoming more and more like the vine.
Now, it also goes on in this passage to talk about fruit. What is this fruit that we're producing? Here's some ideas that I, I came up with. In John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8, let me read this for you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And then verse 8, by this my Father is glorified. By how? By us asking and God answering. God is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So that's one of the ways that we know that we are followers of Jesus and abiding in him and produce fruit is that we pray and that God answers our prayer. Another fruit, and you guys know these, is Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are characteristics in our life, in, in our relationships that God is working in us through his spirit, and we're producing that fruit in our life as our character begins to change. Another fruit that I found was in Colossians 1. Bear fruit in every good deed. So in our good works that we're doing, that's fruit that we're bearing. And the last thing I found was Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Bear fruit in our praise. So as we were singing this morning, we were bearing fruit to God. As John goes on in chapter 15, he talks about abiding in his word. And let me go ahead and read that to you. Again, I'm going to start with verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. And isn't it amazing how interwoven, interconnected, this abiding in Jesus, abiding in his word, abiding in his love, it's all interwoven with each other, and it's supposed to exemplify our lives as we are following Jesus. So how do we stay constant? How do we remain stable in his word? I believe the Bible gives us directions um, on that. That in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we read about that blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So, when I talk about meditation, I know that in, our, in, in America we're influenced by Eastern thought, and it talks about emptying our minds. But in Scripture, it's filling our minds. It's putting truth into our minds and thinking on that and, and contemplating that. Go have a cup of coffee and think of the passage that you just read. Go have a cup of coffee with your friend or your spouse and talk about this passage that you read. And Psalm 1 is talking about a lifetime of practice that we do to help us to abide in his word. One of the things that Carly and I had the privilege of doing this last semester is we were asked to teach an uh, intercultural engagement class at Moody Bible Institute uh, for three hours. It was a tremendous opportunity that we had. One of the assignments that we gave to the students was we wanted them to memorize and to meditate on scripture, and that was the assignment. But we wanted them to take either John chapter 17, the whole chapter, or Genesis chapter one and two. We wanted them to do the whole chapter. And they had to find a partner, and they had to meet with this partner on a weekly basis and talk, and to help each other to memorize and to, to meditate on this passage. And that on a daily basis, they were to read the chapter or listen to the chapter and just begin to get that truth into their minds. And what was amazing that we read in their uh, reports that they would do on a weekly basis, they began to talk about things that began to make sense to them that they had not seen before because they were going over and over and over the scripture. Another 
activity that God, that the scriptures give to us on how to abide in his word is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And that one, I'll just do it from memory, talks about that we are to give our bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice to God, pleasing to God. And how do we do that? Well, it says, don't be conformed to the world. So how do we stop being conformed to the world? How do we stop not following our culture, our habits, our patterns that we, were, we learned? And the next verse, or the next section, tells us that we need to be renewed in our mind, that we need to change the way that we think. We need to transition our, our, our thinking. And so that's what God instructs us to do if we want to abide in his word, that we need to meditate, to memorize, to begin to transform and renew our thinking. Now, as we begin to have the mind of Christ, as we abide in him, abide in his word, our prayers will not be for things. <laughs> they won't be for that new car, or that new house, or that wealth, or that health. But we'll begin to think and pray, maybe the Lord's Prayer, that that would be some, the way that would guide us in our prayer, because we begin to have the mind of Christ, and that we would begin to um, pray that God's name would be lifted up, and that it would be set apart, and it would be unique in the, in, in the city of Zion, in the United States, that we would begin to pray that his kingdom would come, and his will would be done here in Zion like it is in heaven. Here in South Africa, amongst the Amazoni, that his kingdom would come like it is in heaven amongst the Zionists in South Africa. That our prayers, that we would begin to be grateful for what we have, for the food that we have, the shelter that we have, the transportation that we have, the jobs that we have. That we would be a people that would be um, forgiving each other. That when God puts it on your mind and your spirit is talking to you and you're supposed to go and apologize to somebody, that we would do that. And that we would also be asking God to keep us from evil. You know, we're facing trials and we can get sucked back into things. God, keep us from those things. That's how our prayer, and that's how God will begin to answer those prayers. Because they're in line with the mind of Christ. Abiding in, in love. I'll just read verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay his, down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. Obedience is the primary way of knowing and having a relationship with Jesus, of abiding in Jesus. How is it expressed? It is specifically expressed in carrying out the command to love. Obedience is an expression of love. Jesus really loves each and every one of you. Jesus died for each and every one of you. And each and every one of you need to follow him and to abide in him, and to abide in his word, and to abide in his love. Now, the greatest commandment, um, you guys know it, what did Jesus answer? Greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to love. He wants us to um, engage with people. One of the things that we challenged the people in our class at Moody last semester was we wanted them to learn how to tear down walls, to build bridges, to find common ground with people. So if we are abiding in Jesus, if we're abiding in his love, abiding in his word, then we will love. Now, one of the things that I've I've picked up in America is love is a very emotive word. In the Bible, it's more of an action word, but in America, it's more of a working up a feeling. So I love pizza. I love my dog. I love my car. 
I love my wife. So it kind of loses its meaning. But in the Bible, it's an action. And that, that action is that we are to die to our needs to meet the needs of another person. And I believe that God's given us the family to practice this. And I'm talking to husbands now because it's something that I've had to do, deal with and learn how to do on a daily basis, is I'm supposed to love my wife the same way that Jesus loved the church. And how did Jesus love the church? He gave himself. He died to meet the needs of the church. And that's what he wants us to do. And I know that some guys will say, well, I can take a bullet from my wife. But what the Bible is saying is on a daily basis, are you dying to your desires and your drive to meet the needs of your wife and her desires? That's a biblical love. Jesus wants us to abide in him. He wants us to be one with him and with each other. He wants us to love him and others. How do we do it? We abide in Jesus. We abide in his word, and we abide in his love. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to um, learn, to hear your word, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do your work in the life of the people in this congregation, and that we would learn and choose and remain stable in our relationship with you, Jesus, and learning your word and learning and, and, and abiding and trusting in the love that you have for us so that we can go and love others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.